So where are we? Last time. Last time. We got a bunch of derivatives of inverse functions. Uh, derivatives of, I, I don't have these memorized. I hope you guys do. Uh, derivative of inverse sine. Let me, let me make this a minus one. Derivative of inverse sine of x. One over square root of, yeah, okay. I don't have them memorized either, but I think it's something like this. It's gotta be something like this because inverse sine is only defined between minus one and one, right? Because sine takes values. The range of sine is minus one, one. So this has to be something that's defined. I think that's right. How about tan? That was another weird one. Inverse tan. One plus x squared. I think that sounds right. One plus x squared. Okay, so these are some some of the important distributions. Um, we learned this from implicit differentiation, from the chain rule. We we don't need reviews of chain rule, product rule, quotient rule. This this stuff like by now we have down. Uh, right, we differentiated the inverse exponential function, also known as the natural log. Derivative natural log we showed was one over x, and we had a general formula for the derivative of an inverse function, if you have the inverse of a function, when you replace x and y, the slope, instead of being a slope of 10, becomes a slope of 110 at the same point. But that point is moved from x comma y to y comma x. So the slope is 1 over the derivative of the original function at the, uh, at the coordinate of the, of the inverse function. Right, that's where we got all of these things from. So far, so good. Okay, good. Um, we can, using this kind of stuff, and you saw some of this already on your homework, but we can do the kinds of things that we've been discussing uh, from other uh, techniques. So for example, and you'll have more of this on your worksheet, on your workshop assignment. Um, uh, so, so let's do a couple more things. Let's differentiate d dx of a constant to the x. So we know about e to the x, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, okay? What about some constant a to the x? Let's say a is a constant. A is a, is a positive constant, so that it makes sense to exponentiate. How could we figure out something like this? Somebody said? Um, the, okay, different people call these things different things. This, this we would call the exponential rule. The power rule, we're gonna prove separately. Power rule is that the derivative uh, we're going to prove it in a second. The, der the derivative of a power function, this is what I would call the power rule. I mean, these names are a little bit arbitrary. Uh, here, we're, we're taking x and raising it to a power. Here, we're taking x and exponentiating some base to that power. So I would call this the exponent rule or exponentiation rule or something, exponent rule. Again, these names are not what's important. Yusuf, you got something for it? Exactly. You could you could do that. You could do that. Let's do it uh, in two ways. So method one, let's do that over here somewhere. So method one, Yusuf's method, is if we write y equals a to the x, we can take natural log of both sides. It's called logarithmic differentiation. Did we discuss this last time? I can't remember. Not really. Okay. So this is a good a good thing to know how to do. If you if you want to differentiate a complicated function, we'll, we'll do another example of that in just a second. Let's take logs of both sides. So take logs of both sides, take log of both sides. And what you'll get is uh, natural log of y is equal to what's natural log. Okay, let me write it out just one time. Natural log of, of a power is, yeah, the x comes down exactly, x times natural log of a. And now we can differentiate both sides. Then differentiate both sides, differentiate both sides, differentiate both sides. Uh, and what do we get from here? So what's the natural log of y? The derivative with respect to x, of course, we're differentiating with respect to x. Y is implicitly a function of x. 1 over y, the derivative of log is 1 over y. Chain rule times y prime, exactly. And y prime is what we're after. On the other hand, we have x times natural log of a. What's the derivative of that? Yeah, just this is a constant, right? This is a, a this is a line. This is x times a constant. So the so the derivative of x is one, and the derivative of the constant is itself, natural log of a. 
I mean, it's not the derivative of a constant is itself. It's that when you multiply by a constant, that constant just pulls out through the derivative. All right. And that means that y prime, so if we multiply both sides by y, I get that y prime is equal to y times natural log of a. But what was y to begin with? A to the x. So it's a to the x times natural log of a. Okay. So this, this method uh, has a name. This method is called um, logarithmic differentiation logarithmic differentiation. In other words, you take logs first, differentiation, Ugh, ran out. Anyway, you can't read that, can you? Should I make it better? No, you know what it says. Yeah. Here. That's better. Logarithmic <laughs> differentiation. Okay. Say, uh, Nimmer. Uh, x times natural log of a. So if we use the product rule, it's a product of two things. One of those things is a constant. So I can, so if I differentiate x, so if I use the, the product rule, I'll get one times natural log of a plus x times the derivative of natural log of a, which is zero. So this is how we prove that if you have a constant times a function, the derivative of that is just the same constant times the derivative of the function. So that's why the derivative of x is one and the derivative of the constant natural log, uh, sorry, and then the natural log just stays there as the constant in front, okay? Good question, other questions? Um, all right, so that was the method of logarithmic differentiation, or we could write this, so method two, if you like. So use of actually, I actually prefer this. I think you're right that here you would, I would like to do logarithmic differentiation. What I had in mind is instead to write a to the x as um, e to the natural log of a to the x. They're basically the same method. They're basically the same method. You see why e to the natural log of a to the x is the same thing as a to the x? e to the natural log of anything is itself? e and natural log are inverse functions? So if you do it this way, then uh, you can simplify. It's basically the same idea that the x will come down in front the same way that the x came down in front over here. So in that sense, the methods are the same. You're just, one is, is taking the log first and then using implicit differentiation. And the other is writing something as e to the log of the thing to, to take advantage of the exponential. Okay, so this is e to the x times the constant natural log of a. And now I can use the chain rule to differentiate this. So the chain rule says the derivative of e to the whatever is e to the whatever times the derivative of, of whatever, the derivative of what's inside. And what's inside is x times natural log of a. The derivative of that is the constant ln a, thank you. And finally, we remember that e to the x ln a was exactly a to the x, the original a to the x, by putting the x back upstairs and remembering that e to the ln is, uh, is an inverse operation. So we get, again, a to the x times natural log a. Okay. Any questions on the exponent rule? So this is the exponent rule. The derivative of a to the x is a to the x, just like e to the x. The only difference is there's a constant that, that comes out, which is natural log of a. And when a is equal to e, let's, let's make this observation. Observe when a is equal to e, natural log of a, in other words, natural log of e, other than rug of... What's natural log of e? One, right? That's the whole point of the natural log is the log base e. E to what power gives you e? E to the one gives you e, right? So if you think about what this is really saying, well, ah, it's up to you. It's up to you. If, you're, if you prefer taking e, I, I think this is actually a little bit easier for people. I would think that this is, this people would find it easier uh, unless for whatever reason they prefer e to the ln. Yeah, I think I like I, I like use this method better. This is what I would do. But you know, it's math. Like any which way that, at which you arrive at the truth is is the truth, regardless of, of how you got there. Um, okay. So uh, so just to make a little observation, if you think of the the graph of two to the x, so here's y equals two to the x. What's the slope at this is the point 
anything to the anything to the zero. So if x is equal to zero, two to the zero is one, right? And three to the zero is one, and e to the zero is one, and so on. What's the slope here? The slope of this tangent line. That's a good guess. Well, just think about what the slope would be. We want to differentiate two to the x. Okay, so here's a question. Think about this for a second. Question. Slope of line tangent to y equals two to the x at the point zero comma one. What is the slope? How do we work out slopes? We're really, uh, you guys are like, should we take a nap and try again on, on Friday? It's the derivative, of course, it's the derivative. It's the derivative, so the derivative of two to the x, so y prime, if y is two to the x, y prime is, let's apply, yeah, two to the x times ln of two, natural log of two. And if I evaluate this at x equals zero, so this is evaluated at x equals zero, evaluated at x equals zero, I get two to the zero, two to the zero is one times natural log of two, natural log of two. So roughly, how big is E? Yeah, E is 2.7 something, right? 2.7 something. So natural log of two, two to a positive power or a negative power? Sorry, um, what? natural log of two. What, what will natural log of two, it, will it be one, less than one, bigger than one? Less than one, right? Because I have a power, so I want to raise e to some power to get two, but e is bigger than two. So I have to raise it to a power less than one. I have to take some root of e to get two. So this is some number that's less than one. So that's why I drew this slope as being less than 45 degrees. Does that make sense? What if I had done three to the x? What if we had done y equals three to the x? So three to the x is going to be bigger. Y equals three to the x is going to be bigger than two to the x when we're to the right, but smaller when x is negative. And of course, three to the zero is still one. So what's the slope? What's the slope of, we're about to do some related rates, but we're not ready for that yet. We need one more page. Um, there we go. Yeah, what's the slope of uh, uh, three to the x at the same place at x equals zero, at x equals zero? Somebody already said it. log of three, ln of three. Is ln of three bigger than one, less than one? Bigger because e, e is 2.7, so 3 is bigger, so you have to raise 2.7 to a power greater than 1 to get the number 3. So this is some number bigger than 1. So this slope is going to be bigger than 45 degrees. And e is exactly the number. We said this uh, before, but now we can, really, we can really see it. e is exactly the number whose slope, that's one definition of e. It's exactly the power whose slope here is 45 degrees, whose slope is 1. Does that make sense? That's the significance of this number e. It's the, it's the number which at the point zero one has slope exactly equal to one. One of the many significances. Okay, so uh, for e to the x, for y equals e to the x, the slope at zero one, slope of the tangent line at zero one is exactly equal to one because natural log of e is exactly equal to one. Generally. Please. If instead of three, ah, great. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, so um, go away. Out of my way. How do I get, you don't see that. Oh, you see that, but not the Zoom thing. How do I get rid of the Zoom thing? All right, hopefully that'll be, okay. So Jenny's question is if it was, here's another example, y equals three to the two x, okay? There are two ways, at least two ways that I would think about doing this. Anybody have a suggestion? If we wanted to find the derivative, right? You want to differentiate y prime. The, the simplest thing I could think of is, is what? 
Although you could do logarithmic differentiation, but now we, yes. Okay, so there are three ways now. Uh, way one is logarithmic differentiation. We could just, we could simplify it. That was method two that I had in mind. There was method one that I thought you guys would just jump right on. Somebody said it. Chain rule, right? Let's just use the chain rule. So if we use the chain rule, it's three to the something. The derivative of three to the something is three to the same thing times natural log of three. That's just the derivative of three to the whatever, but now I need the chain rule to differentiate what's inside. What's inside is two X. The derivative of two X is two. So I would get this. Okay, so this is chain rule. Method one is chain rule. Chain rule. Let's do all three. Uh, method two was to simplify. I think somebody said, Hari said, or Vi, Vi said, okay. So how would you simplify this? Exactly. Three to the two X is three to the two to the X. Because three to the two to the X is three to the two X. And three to the two is nine. So three to the two X is the same as nine to the X. And so that we can differentiate at using the exponent rule. So this will be nine to the X times log of nine, log of nine. Why are these two the same thing? Because nine is three squared. This is nine to the X is three to the two X as before. And log of nine is natural log of three squared. And that two could come down and become that two. Okay, and the third way you could do it, some people said logarithmic differentiation. So let's try logarithmic differentiation. If I take logs of both sides, natural log of y is 2x times natural log of 3. I've already brought the 2x down. We differentiate both sides of this. I get 1 over y times y prime is equal to, these are just constants times x. That's what makes logarithmic differentiation, logarithmic differentiation so nice. Uh, 2 natural log of 3. And look at what this is. This is y itself times some constant, and the constant is 2 times natural log of 3, which is exactly what logarithmic, logarithmic differentiation. I'm going to say it nice and slow every time I need to say it. And I'll need to say it a couple of times today. That's exactly what, what this will give. Okay? Gives the same answer. Three different ways of doing the same thing. Does that make sense? Everybody happy? I mean, relatively speaking, I realize it's Tuesday morning math class. Okay. Speaking of logarithmic differentiation, I got it right that time. Uh, here's a here's the type of example where it's really good to have logarithmic differentiation. Um, let's make up some really ugly function. Uh, x squared plus 2 to the 3 fifths times x minus 1 squared over x plus 2, x cubed plus 2 to the 1 half. I don't know. Like... Uh, another another thing? No, no, you had enough. Okay, x minus five, right? Imagine differentiating this monstrosity using what quotient rule, and then product rule, and then chain rule on steroids. Like this would be an absolute. It would take you ten minutes to write all of this out. But we have logarithmic differentiation. So if we take logs of both sides, watch what happens. Log of y. The log of a quotient is minus, yep, log of minus. So I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all I'm gonna get this plus log of this plus log of this minus log of this minus log of that. But what happens to logs of exponents? They come down. So watch this. It's three fifths natural log of x squared plus two plus two natural log of x minus one minus a half natural log of x cubed plus 2 minus natural log of x minus 5. You see what I did? All the nasty exponents just come down in front as constants, and all of these products and, and quotients just become additions and subtractions. Yo, yeah. Oh, maybe that wasn't for the problem. No, it was. Oh, good. It was for the problem. Good. Why did I subtract log of x minus 5? Because um, a couple of ways to think about this. Either we're thinking about dividing this whole thing, which means there's a minus sign in front of both of these. Or you can think of I divided by this and then I divide by that. 
And so log of I and either in either case, uh, you can think of this as, as this will be turned into subtraction one way or another. So anything on top gets a plus sign, anything on bottom gets a minus sign. That's another way to do it. Should I let me take these back? But there would have been nothing wrong with having the parentheses there as long as you also have the, the plus sign. Now differentiating is easy. Der derivative log of y, one over y, y prime. We've done this a thousand times. And I'm going to make my primes a little bit more sideways. How about the derivative of this thing? Oh boy, this is going to be nasty. No, it's going to be easy. Three fifths is a constant. That stays. Derivative of log is one over the thing, chain rule, times 2x. Next, plus two times one over x minus one, minus a half times one over x cubed plus two times chain rule, 3x squared, minus one over x minus five. And we're basically done. The only thing that's left, if we really want to finish the whole thing, is to multiply everything by y. But that's easy. y prime is equal to, I just have to copy. In fact, let me be lazy and literally copy. You got the toy. You got to play with it. There's y. I realize you can't do this on an exam. That's the only drawback. Times, oh man, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Does it work? Copy, paste, and and can I rescale it to fit inside? Oh my God, that is that is nice. Oh, I got a missing uh, a dangling participle or whatever it's called. Uh, there we go. That's y prime in one minute. You like it? Okay. So that's the beauty of logarithmic differentiation with a copy and paste feature. Otherwise you have to just write it out by hand, but writing out by hand is nowhere near as difficult as imagine doing the product and the chain rule. You would make so many mistakes. I would make so many mistakes. Keeping track of the chain, the, the quotient rule, inside of the product rule, inside of the chain rule. Jenny. The three X is missing the square. I did not grab the square on the three X. Thank you. That is the danger of copy and paste, the copy and paste method uh, anyway. Okay. Logarithmic differentiation, good. Um, speaking of the power rule, remember I kept telling you we didn't we didn't prove the true power rule. I mean, we gave the we gave some hints of the proof in the case of integer values and negative values and and some half integer values, but now we can prove the full uh, power rule exactly by logarithmic differentiation. If x is if y is x to the alpha, that's a power. If I take logs of both sides natural log of y is equal to alpha natural log of x. I differentiate both sides. One over y times y prime is, other than raga. What is it? Yeah, uh, so if I differentiate this, I get alpha, alpha over x, is that what you're saying? Alpha is the constant. The derivative of log is one over X. And now I move the Y prime back over. I'm sorry, the Y, the one over Y that's here. I'll, I'll multiply it to the other side and I get Y prime is equal to alpha. Well, Y, Y is X to the alpha times alpha times one over X. Also known as alpha times X to the alpha minus one. Is one less power of x. So that's a rigorous rule, rigorous proof of the power rule for any exponent alpha. Cool? Does that make sense? You guys happy with that? You're going to get a couple more uh, in the workshop. You'll get a couple more uh, examples to practice this logarithmic differentiation idea how you can use it to prove things like the product rule, the quotient rule. It's a little bit circular because we use the product rule and quotient rule to prove these kinds of things, but actually, no, we use the chain rule, which didn't use it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You get some more practice. Will. Um, so I have X to the alpha divided by X. So that's one less power of X, right? This is X to the negative one times X to the alpha. 
So if I combine those, I get X to the alpha. So good question. Other questions? Okay. Um, the next batch of things, this is the last batch of things we have to do before the midterm, um, is related rates. I don't know how you guys feel. I personally hate related rates problems, but they're going to be on your test. And they're actually, I mean, the thing that I hate about them isn't the problems themselves. They're actually kind of fun problems. It's how, con you'll see, they're, they're very contrived problems. All right, let's do, a, let's do a bunch of related rates problems. Any questions before we get to related rates? All right, so I just grabbed a bunch of, I can't make these up on my, on my own, so I have to grab them from the book or wherever. All right, example one. You ready for this? We got water running into, the hardest thing about this for me is I hate reading. Uh, water runs into a canonical, conical, not a canonical tank, not the tank that's the tank that like all it is, the conical tank, it's a cone at a rate. Of, so we got a hose in here and water is flowing in at a rate of nine feet per second, nine feet cubed per minute. Okay, cubic feet, that's how you would measure the volume of water per minute. Okay, that's how much is going in. So there's like a, a water is flowing in. The tank stands point down. So the point is down, got it. And has a height of 10 feet. So this is 10 feet and a base radius of five feet. Base radius, not diameter, but base radius. Okay, so there's water pouring in and it's filling up. And of course, it's gonna fill up at different heights or at different, I don't know what, what we're gonna have to measure depending on where it is. At first, it looks like it's filling up really quite, really fast, right? If you imagine a cone, at first the height is, is rising very quickly. Once you've filled up a whole lot of it, you add a bunch more water, well, at the same rate, at the same nine cubic feet per minute, it's not going to make that much of a difference because that's getting spread out over a larger surface area. Does that make sense? So, so I'm just imagining, before I even read the rest of the question, I'm imagining what the question is going to ask us. How fast is the water level rising when the water is six feet deep? So that's this Y. Y is going to be six feet. We're interested at the instant when Y is six feet, but we're really interested in the derivative of Y with respect to time. Okay, so what we want is the derivative of y with respect to time. So we need to set up a formula that relates y to volume. Okay, does everybody see what's going on? Now, thankfully, we've been given the formula for the volume of a cone with um, a base of x, if this is x, and a height of y. So it's this, if you had a cylinder, it would be pi r squared, which is the area of every cross section times h for the height of the cylinder. And then the miraculous thing, which you'll prove actually, I mean, Archimedes proved this kind of stuff. So you don't have to wait until calc two or three, but in calc three, uh, you'll prove things like this, maybe even in calc two, whatever. Maybe in calc one, maybe we'll prove this. I don't remember. It's not that hard to prove. It's actually pretty simple. Anyway. Um, so the volume is one third. It turns out the volume of a cone is one third the volume of the cylinder. So that's this magic. Uh, Archimedes like loved this stuff, and, and he was the master of this stuff. So the, so the, the only number you don't have to right now you have to memorize. Eventually you will you will know this because you'll derive it. Uh, right now you need to know the fact that the volume of a conical, uh, well a cone, a conical cone, is uh, one third times pi r squared h. Our R is, we're calling X, the radius at the, at the base, and, uh, and the height as well. Okay, so far so good. Everybody understand the problem? All right, here's the thing. We can have too many variables. We have the volume. What, what do we know? What do we know about the volume? How's the volume changing with respect to time? That's exactly the nine. The nine is how much volume is being added every uh, minute, right? We get nine cubic feet of water added every minute. So this is nine cubic feet of water per minute. That we know. We have this relationship between volume and a x and y, but that's too many variables. We have to get rid of one of them. Can we express what we want is the derivative of, of y, the height. Can we express x in terms of y? Ron? Um, well, do we know that x is equal to t? Jenny, why? Why do you say that? Oh, 
ratio. Yes. Yes. So Genini is looking at this triangle, which starts out being a height of 10 and a radius of five. And what she's observing is that at any point, at any time, if the height is Y, we have similar triangles. This triangle is similar to this triangle. Does everybody see that? And so if the original cone has a height that's twice as much as the radius, then at any stage, the cone will have a height that's twice as much as the radius. So if this is Y, what is this? Well, we call it X, but what will it be? Y will be twice as much. Y will be twice as much as this. So this will be a half Y, a half Y, Y over two. Okay, does everybody see that? So we needed, this is what's hard about related rates problems. A, you have to read, and we already know how I feel about that. Uh, but then you have to think. Well, thinking I like actually, but uh, this is like, you have to hunt for the clues in the problem to know where to, where to get this kind of a clue. Okay, does that make sense? Is everybody with me so far? Now it gets easy because what we have is the volume is one third pi, that's just the formula for the volume, uh, with a given radius. The radius is one half is y over two squared. So let's write that y over two squared times y. And now we have a relationship just between the volume and y. Let's simplify this just a little bit. Uh, what do I get here? That one half squared is a quarter times three is, I guess, pi over 12 is a constant. And then I get y squared times another y is y cubed. So now we've expressed the volume in terms of a constant times y cubed. Let's differentiate both sides with respect to time. We're interested in what's happening as time changes, bless you. Okay, we're interested in what happens as time changes. So the derivative of volume with respect to time will be, there's some constant, pi over 12, nothing we can do about the constant. Y cubed will differentiate Implicitly, yeah, it's 3y squared times dy dt, dy dt. Okay, so this is just the chain rule and implicit differentiation applied to a word problem. That's all related rates are. Related rates is chain rule applied to a word problem. Is everybody with me so far? All right, what do we know about the rate of change of volume with respect to time? That's our water flowing in. This is nine. Nine. Let's keep track. I hate units, but we have to keep track of the units. Nine watts. Cubic feet per minute. Okay. We want to evaluate. We want to know the answer, not just at, at any point of time. So, so now we have it as a function of, of time, which Y is implicitly a function of time. But actually, we want to know when the height is six feet, when we filled up six feet of water already. So we're going to evaluate this at Y equals six feet. Okay, and watch what happens to the units actually. So this 12 over pi, uh, pi over 12 is unitless. Uh, so is the three, but then I have to square y. So that's six squared, which is 36. Feet squared, excellent. Feet squared times whatever this dy dt is. I put a cube because I'm dyslexic. Feet squared. Okay, does everybody see that? Does that make sense? All right, um, let's, let's combine these two forms. So let's solve for dy dt. dy, the change of the height with respect to time is I have this nine cubic feet per minute. And then I'm gonna divide by all of this stuff. So I'm gonna divide by pi. I'm going to divide by, can I simplify this a little? I have a 12 and a 36. Three, okay, so that's three. Three times three, nine. So I'll put the nine over here. In fact, that's going to cancel that nine in a second. And feet squared is one over feet squared because I'm dividing to the other side. Everybody see what I did? Okay, great. The nines also cancel. Feet cubed on top, feet squared on bottom. That is why it's good to keep the units. So you can check at the end whether the units you've come up with have canceled out in the right way and make sense. What we're left with is, looks like one over pi, it's about a third feet per minute. 
feet per minute. <coughs> the height is changing about a third of a foot per minute when the height is six feet. That's the answer. One over pi feet per minute. Did anybody get that? Nice. Always, always at the end of these problems, check back and read the original problem because there's a very good chance if you're like me that you've solved a correct problem, just not the problem it asked. So let's make sure that we actually solve the thing that it, that it wanted us to. Uh, how fast is the water level rising when the water is six feet deep? Yes, indeed, that is one over pi feet per minute. That's the rate of change of Y with respect to time. Okay, good. We solved the problem that, that was asked. Any questions? Julius. If you know that the radius is three. Okay, so this is six, uh, that's three. Um, why can't you sub that in here? Because this three is also changing. So you can, this is gonna be more complicated. Uh, this is what you'll do in multivariable calculus. When you have several variables, all depending, if you have a variable V that depends on X and Y freely, then you can differentiate, you can take the gradient of, of V. Uh, I'm saying words that we're not, that I shouldn't be in. Um, X is changing. X is equal to three at that instant, but it's also changing, just like Y is changing. So if you just plugged in three for X, that would not in, take into account the fact that X is changing and you would think of X as a constant as, you're, as you differentiate both sides. Does that make sense? Um, try it and you'll see you'll get the wrong answer. Right, if we had a cylinder, that's a good point. Exactly. If we had a cylinder, so Julius's Julius's point. Let's let's remark. If we had a cylinder that was filling up, and uh, and the volume is uh, now now not one third, but just pi r squared h. If this is r and this is h, and let's say it's filled up to a certain height y. Let's keep that same y. This r would be a constant. It's not changing with with uh, time, and so it it would just remain a constant, and you would just differentiate h and V with respect to time. But because X is also changing as you fill up more, uh, we need to take that into account when we differentiate. Good question. Other questions? The only way I know to get good at related rates is to do a thousand related rates. Andrew. Would this sort of problem ever be different to have like an hourglass filling up? Okay, if you had an hourglass filling up, um, if you have an hourglass filling with water, uh, you would have to be quite careful. So there's like a hose here and water filling up. Um, you'd have to be quite careful about what this curve is. And because we use the fact that this curve is a straight line to give us this two to one ratio of the height to the width at any time. Uh, now, what's the rate? How does the height depend on the width? Well, it's complicated. So uh, yes, you can solve such things. Uh, I don't think I would be that cruel as to put a problem like this on there, but you could do it. This could be like a sign or something. I don't know what, but let, let's, uh, yes. You, you can solve it in, in the same way. It'll just be more complicated. Let's do another example. Do another example. I got a whole, you know, the, the rest of the day is examples with uh, related rates. All right. You want to read this one first? You want to try it on your own? Can you read that, I hope? Yeah. A hot air balloon rising straight up from a level field is tracked by a range finder. You know what a range finder is? It's a little thing that like tells you how far away you are. So, so the balloon starts out here and it rises straight up from a, from a level field. Okay, the field is flat, fine. It's tracked by a range finder that's located 150 meters from the liftoff point. So the range finder is here at 150 meters away from where the balloon took off. At the moment, the range finder's elevation angle is pi over four. So that's 45 degrees, pi over four. So when the range finder is looking at the balloon at a 45 degree angle, the angle is increasing at a rate of whatever radians per minute. So the angle as the, the balloon starts out at angle zero and then it starts rising and the range finder keeps, keeps uh, looking for the balloon and the angle is changing as the balloon's height changes. Okay, so then we're told that the instant we're looking 45 degrees, the balloon's height is increasing by 0.14 radians per minute. So far, so good. And the question is, how fast is the balloon rising 
at that moment. Any ideas? We have to find log Dan. by doing uh, 150 times 10 power uh, 4. Beautiful. Idea number one, let's get a relationship between the variable we know and the variable we uh, want to know. Okay. Last time we were given, we were almost given that relationship. It was volume. We had this X that we had to get rid of to, to just get a relationship, algebraic relationship between X and Y. So now let's get a relationship between Y, the thing we want, and theta, the thing we know. We know we're at 45 degrees. What's the height, by the way, at that instant? If it's 45 degrees, we're 150 meters away. The height is also 150 because that's a 45, 45, 90 isosceles triangle. Everybody see that? I hope you're, you're catching that kind of stuff. So Y will be equal to uh 150 also at that instant when it's 45 degrees and the question is how fast is y changing dan says we need a relationship between the angle and y what do we know let's look at this right triangle we want y we know this 150 and we want if this angle that's screaming for tangent tangent is opposite over adjacent so our relationship is tan theta is opposite y over adjacent 150. Everybody see how you would come up with that relationship? Now it's easy. What are we gonna do? Hold on. Let's take the derivative with respect to theta or y? Neither, t. Time is what's changing, right? Trick, sorry, trick question. You used to trick questions for me by now. Yeah, time is what's changing. Time is the fundamental unit of, of anything. Time is what's changing. So we're going to differentiate with respect to time. So uh, take the derivative with respect to time. So if I differentiate tan theta with respect to, what's the derivative of tan? Secant squared? Secant squared or secant tan? Secant squared. Okay, good. The derivative of tan is secant squared. So I get secant squared theta times chain rule, implicit differentiation. Yeah, d theta dt. That's the derivative on one side. On the other side, I have this constant one over 50. Nothing happens to the constant. The derivative of y is y prime, dy dt. Does everybody see that? Value, you're shaking your head and no, like, yeah, you know, you know what we're doing. Okay, good. Um, okay, now we need to know what, what is secant squared of pi over four when the angle is pi over four. Secant of pi over four. Pi over four is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So uh, how do we want to do this? Uh, one, one, root two or something? What, how do you guys like to do your 45, 90, 90? What is it? One, one, root two. Okay, you like one, one, root two. Some people always want this or often want this to be one. And then there's like one over root two and one over root two. Okay, so that's, that's our 45, 45 degree angle. And so cosine is one over root two, cosine of 45 degrees is one over root two, root two over two. So secant is root two, right? And secant squared, so this is root two squared, it's just two. Everybody see that? Am I going too slow or too fast? Will. That triangle is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. It's supposed to be a 45, 45, 90 triangle. If I could write a 45, 45 degrees. Yeah, so it's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And if the side length, if the sides are one and one, one square plus one squared is something squared, that something is root two. Okay, so that's how we would work out the secant. The secant of 45 degrees is root two squared. What's the rate of change of the angle? Point one, yeah, whatever it is, we were told. It's 0 0.14, 0 0.14 radians per minute, radians per minute, Now, there's something's going to be funny because we don't measure height in radians. 
So we're going to have to deal with that in a second. We'll come back to that. Uh, is 150, okay, let's, let's multiply that 150 over here. 150 times this, times this, times this radians per minute is dy dt. So the rate of change of the height is radians per minute. Now, uh, what's the relationship between radians and feet or whatever? Per, per minute. Uh, do I mean meters? No, no, I mean radians. We measure angles and radians. And the question is, what's the, what's the, uh, how do we convert? We, we can't say that Y is something in radians per minute. So what are we gonna do to convert from radians to feet? What is a radian? Yes, exactly, exactly. As An what, what Annabelle is saying. Annabelle is saying, if I have a circle and if a radian is this distance, if, right, this distance is, is one radius. If I start walking this distance and I walk along the circle, that distance, that is one radian. Whatever this distance was, if I, this distance walked along the circle is one radian. That's what a radian is measuring. And so as the angle changes, we need to know what the, um, what this, if you like, you could do it in terms of this distance, let's see. How should we do this? In terms of, um, if this is pi over four, then this radian is changing on a circle. As the radian is changing, the measure here is changing. And what's the length of this, this distance? L let's do it like this. If, if we had a full circle, this distance is um, 150 meters, 150 meters. So this hypotenuse is, 150 root two, 150 root two meters. Okay, so at that instant, at that instant, I have a, a circle whose length is 150 root two, whose radius is 150 root two, this is meant to be a circle. And I know whether, what a, so I wanna know how much a radian is on that circle. Well, what would a full rotation be? How many radians is a full rotation? Two pi. Right, two pi radians, so two pi radians on this circle would be equal to um, how many uh, uh, two pi radians is how many feet? Two pi radians of this circle, of the circle of this radius, is how many feet? If we know that the, or meters, meters rather, we're measuring things in meters. So this is 150 root two meters. So two pi radians is. Raga? Yeah, it's just two pi times the radius, and the radius is 150, 150 times root two meters. In other words, a radian, the distance of one radian is just the radius of whatever the circle is. That's what a radian is, right? It's the radius, a, ra a radian, the distance of one radian is the distance of the radius of one radius of the circle. That's why it's called radian. And so all we are saying here is that two pi radians is equal to two pi times 150 root two meters. So forget about the two pi's, one radian is 150 root two meters. So if we wanna convert from radians to meters, uh, let's see, where can I do this? Let me put it over here. So dy dt is equal to, I have this 150 times root two squared, that's two, times uh, 0.14 radians per minute, per minute. And then I wanna multiply it by one so that the radians get killed off. So the radians should be in the denominator. So if I can write this as one is equal to, if I cross, if I cancel off the two pi's on both sides, then I have 150 times root two meters per radian. And if that's equal to one, I can multiply this equation by one and that one will be 150 root two meters per radian, 
which is the same thing as replacing one radian by 150 root two meters. And that's the answer. This is some number, 150 squared times two root two. I mean, okay, I'll write it out, but it, it has no meaning anymore. 150 squared is some number times two root two, two root two is some number times 0 0.14. This is just, again, some number meters per minute, meters per minute. And that's the answer, Yusuf. Why is 150 squared? Because um, there's a 150 here and another one there. I'm just combining the two 150s. Dan. Which is 150 root two? This 150 root two. Yeah. So we, we went back to this circle and a radian of this circle, the length of the radian, the length of the radius of this circle is 150 root two meters. So when we get a change of radians per minute, at this scale, that reflects a change of 150 root two meters is one radian. Does that make sense? Okay, so again, this is something that we just need to get enough practice with so that we get an answer at the end of the day that is meters per minute, which is how you should be measuring the height if the height is being measured in meters. Does that make sense? I got like six more of these, so. Let's do as many related rates as we can until time runs out. But could we do this with practice? I realize it's the first time we're, we're trying it. All right, next. Okay, a police cruiser approaching a right angled intersection from the north. Before I do anything further, draw a picture. I need to draw a picture. There's a right angled intersection. The police cruiser is approaching from the north. Heading south, okay. Approaching right angle intersection from the north is changing a speeding car that has turned the corner and is now moving straight east. Okay, so if this was the police car, it's turned a corner and it's heading east. So the, the getaway car is going east. Uh, I'm about to write east, but I wanna say getaway car or car, whatever, okay? So here's the police car, it's heading south. It's reaching an intersection and the getaway car has already turned the intersection and is heading straight east. The cruiser is 0.6 miles north of the intersection. So the cruiser, let's put the cruiser right there. This is 0.6 miles. Okay. And the car is 0.8 miles to the east. Of course, 6, 8, 6, 8, 10 is a, uh, yeah. This is why these problems are often, you, you'll see. I think this one is particularly cooked up. Okay, so I have six, eight. Of course, this distance we know by the Pythagorean theorem is 10, six, eight, 10, but really 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So 10 is, is one, one mile. All right, before I even keep, before I keep reading anything, everything that I read, I want to, I want to encapsulate in a picture. Um, all right, cruiser is approaching intersection, chasing a speeding car, turn the corner, is moving east. The cruiser is 0 0.6 miles north of the intersection. The car is 0 0.8 miles to the east. The police determine with radar that the distance between them, so here's the distance between them, is increasing at 20 miles an hour. So if this, so let's give these names. Let's call this X. X is the, uh, I guess I should call it Y. That would make more sense. So if Y is the height of the police car, Y is the distance of the police car with respect to time approaching the intersection. Uh, X, X is the distance, the Chase, the car being chased is from the intersection. And let's say S, S is often the, the distance for some reason. So S, or do you want to call it D? D for distance? What do you guys like? Pick one. D? Okay, D. So D is the distance. D is this distance. D. Oh, D, 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 T. Yeah, that's why you don't like D. Okay, that's... I knew there was a reason that we often use S. Okay, so S is this distance. So what do we know about the distance? S squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared. Okay, so we're gonna use the Pythagorean theorem. That's our relationship. We know that the distance DS DT, okay, so the, the car as the radar, the radar isn't measuring uh, along a, a turn. The radar is measuring a, a direct line of sight, right? So, so the direct line of sight measurement is that the car is getting away from them at 20 miles an hour. 
20 miles an hour. So this distance is increasing. The cruiser is moving at 60 miles an hour at the instant of measurement. So the police cruiser is moving. So that's uh, dy, right? dy dt. It's who said? Ying said it's decreasing. It's decreasing at 60. The distance y is getting smaller and smaller. Y is going to zero. So even though the speed is 60 miles an hour, the velocity is negative 60 miles an hour, as Halan said. Does everybody see that? These kind of minus signs are part of what's what makes these problems tough. You really have to think about what's going on. Y is decreasing at a rate of 60 miles an hour. Why is this positive measurement? So far, so good. And presumably the question is, what's the speed of the car? What's the speed of the car? So we want to know dx and the and we want we want dx dt. Okay, does that make sense? So far, so good. Okay. Um, if you know exactly how far the car is, first of all, how do you know exactly how far the car is? That it's 0.8 miles. How would you know that? If you know that, then you could measure the distance. If you measure its speed, if you can accurately measure its distance at two instants, then you can measure its speed. You don't need to go through this. That's that's one of the reasons these problems are cooked up. Okay, you have to suspend your disbelief, right, about this situation. Fine. Let's let's use math to solve this problem, even though math isn't what should solve this problem in the real world. Right. Okay. So what are we supposed to do? We have this relationship. We have three things that are changing with time, S and X and Y. So let's take this relationship and differentiate everything with respect to T, time. Okay, so the derivative of this with time, 2S times the derivative of S with respect to time. Uh, that, that's on one hand. On the other hand, 2X times the rate of change of x with respect to time plus 2y dy dt. Does everybody see how we did that? S changes with time and x is a function of time and y is a function of time. So we can just differentiate all of them with respect to time. If we have an equality, this equality holds for all time. So when we take the rate of change with respect to time, the equality still holds. All right, now we know everything but uh, but but dx, this is what we want. Um, two times s, what is s at that instant? One mile, two times one mile. What's the rate of change of s? That's this 20. So he's getting away from us at 20 miles an hour. 20, I'll write it as miles per hour. So I can compare miles and miles. Raga? we could we could we could cancel the twos we could before we do anything we could cancel all these twos i agree with that decision okay so the twos are gone so s times ds dt is equal to what's x 0.8 0.8 miles times dx dt which is the unknown plus y what's y 0.6 miles 0.6 miles times dy dt negative negative 60 miles per hour okay um is this not too bad to do in in our heads so what am i getting here uh 0.6 times 60 that's six times six, that's 36. So that's a negative 36. This is a 20, 36 and 20 is 56. So I think if I, when I move this to the other side, I get a 56, somebody please check that I'm doing this right, mile squared per hour is equal to, okay, and I have to divide by 0.8. Seven. 70, 70. So I have to divide by 0 0.8, 0 0.8 miles will give me dx dt. And that is 56 divided by eight is seven and a 0.8 is 70 miles per hour. So the getaway car is moving at 70 miles per hour. Now, if we didn't have this minus sign, we would get the totally wrong answer. I hope you see that. 
we would take this 20 and subtract 36 instead of adding 36. Everybody see that? Okay, so, so do a reality check when you're done with the calculation that the, okay, the getaway car is going 70 miles an hour. The police car is only going 60 miles an hour towards the intersection, and that's why he's getting away at 20 miles an hour. Any questions? Then where did I get the 56 from? So I took the 20. The uh, 0.6 times negative 60 is negative 36. And I moved the 36 to the other side. 20 plus 36 is 56. Thank you for asking that because I guarantee there are 10 other people that were confused about that. Does that make sense now? All right. Should we do one as a quiz? Let's see. Is this one good or, or, or bad? I think this is a good one. All right, let's do this one. Let's, let's try this one as a quiz. A quiz with lots of hints. These problems are hard, and the only way to get good at them is to do 100 of them. All right, go, get to it. A particle P moves clockwise, as opposed to counterclockwise, is moving clockwise, in a constant rate along a circle of radius 10 meters centered at the origin. First thing you should do, draw a picture. If you don't have a circle on your page, you're doing it wrong. The particle's initial position is 0, 010, so that's the north pole on the y axis. Its final destination is 10, 0 on the x axis. All right, so we're just moving over the quarter circle from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Once the particle's in motion, the tangent line at P, I got to draw this. I hope you guys are drawing. It's a quiz. It's a quiz. Try, try it out. Try it by yourself. Take a good 10 minutes. This is something that's good you have to chew on. And, and talk to each other and, and ask for help and so on. What does it feel to do one of these by yourself? You think there's going to be a related race question on the midterm? The midterm? It's between five and 100. Somewhere in between. What difference does it make? The problems are whatever they are, right? The skill. How many yeah. skills are on the midterm? That I can tell you. 3.1, 3.2, 3.10. Those are the skills that are on the midterm. All right, who needs help? Okay, so it starts in 10-0. That's going to... Sorry, 0 is going to start. 0 is going to 10-0. I got to draw this picture. I, I can't help you until I know what, what's going on. So I got a circle centered at the origin, radius 10. It starts here at the North Pole and it ends here. This is the start, this is the end. Once the particle is in motion, the tangent line at P, so here's P, here's the particle P. The tangent line at P intersects the X axis at a point Q, which moves over time. If it takes the particle 30 seconds to travel from start to finish, ah, and it's moving at a constant, yeah, constant rate, Okay, so if it takes it 30 seconds to do the whole thing, to, to go from the North Pole to the East, how fast is the point Q? So what's Q doing? When it starts out, Q is out at infinity, right? If the tangent line is parallel, then Q is the, the x-axis and, and the, these two lines intersect at infinity. Q is infinitely large. They're parallel lines. Parallel lines... You were told parallel lines don't intersect. They do intersect. They intersect at infinity. 
Never mind. Um, it starts, so as soon as we move a little bit, now we have Q coming out over here. And once we come all the way to here, Q is equal to P at the very end. So Q is coming in. Q is coming in like this. P is coming down clockwise. If it takes part of 30 seconds to travel from start to finish, that means we can get a rate, we can get a travel time, a, a, a rate of uh, procession. How fast is the point Q moving along the X axis when it, meaning Q, is 20 meters? So if this is Q out, of, out here, if this is 10, a radius of 10 meters, meters, meters. When Q is 20 meters, twice as far, how fast is Q moving? What, what have people drawn so far? We're going to run out of time if I, if I let this uh, go too long. What have people drawn? Have you drawn a picture like this? Okay. We need a variable. What's a re reasonable variable? X, X, X being the distance to Q. You want to call that distance X? X is the distance to Q. Distance uh, to Q, Q to, to the origin. Q to zero, zero. Okay, what's another variable? X is the thing we actually want. So that's a good variable to have. Time, time is changing, but how do we keep track of where the particle is? Why? We're moving along a, a, a circle. So I would think you would wanna keep track of, yeah, the angle, right? There's an angle here. So the angle is theta and theta starts. So theta goes from, from pi over two down to zero. Okay. So how far does it travel? Theta travels pi over two. How long does it take it to travel that? 30 seconds. So the change in theta over time It, it covers pi over two radians per 30 seconds. Right? And it's doing so constantly. It's moving at a constant speed. Did you guys get something like that? No, but could you have? Bless you. Again, this is the first time we're seeing this kinds of these kinds of problems. It takes practice to get to get good at them. Okay. So we know uh, theta. Well, we know how theta is changing in terms of radians per second. Actually, radians we can easily convert to uh, the radius because the radius is ten meters. So this is pi over two. Well, pi over two to over thirty. So that's pi over sixty. Uh, radian is 10 meters per second. Okay, so the angle, if you measure the angle as meters traveled from the beginning, it's uh, 10 over 60, that's one sixth high meters, not miles, meters, meters per second. Okay, and if we think about this, after 30 seconds, if that's the rate of change, after 30 seconds, we've traveled one sixth times pi over six times 30 seconds. Am I getting this right? We should travel pi over two radians. Pi over two radians should be pi over two times 10, which is 10 pi over two uh, meters. That's exactly what this is, 10 pi over two. If I multiply this by 30 seconds, you, you see what I'm saying? If I take this rate of change, this, this rate is pi over six. If I cancel the 10 and the 60, I get pi over six meters per second. If that's how fast the angle is traveling, I mean this this point, uh, this this point is traveling this fast, and if I do that over thirty seconds times thirty seconds, so thirty over ten over six. I'm getting ahead of myself. Thirty over six is is pi is is a uh, five, so five is ten times pi over two meters meters. Right, which is how far the particle has traveled, because it's it, the distance that it would travel if it went all the way around would be two pi times ten meters, two pi two pi r, 
is the full circumference. We're only doing a quarter of that. So it's pi over two times 10 meters. That's just the reality, a sanity check. Okay. All right. So this is the rate of change d theta dt as measured in meters per second. What is the distance x as a function of theta? Let's, let's draw the picture again. I'll draw it over here. So this is theta. Here's our tangent line. And here's the point Q that we're interested in. If this is theta and this distance, the radius, 10 meters. So this is um, hypotenuse over adjacent is X. Or sorry. What is hypotenuse over adjacent? Adjacent over hypotenuse would be cosine. So hypotenuse over adjacent is secant. That's exactly what secant is, remember? Secant is this distance. Secant of theta is this distance when, when the radius is one. So uh, secant of theta, sec theta, is hypotenuse over adjacent is x over 10 meters. All right, if you figured out a way to write the formula for theta in terms of meters per second, since that's how we're gonna measure distance, give yourself a point. Did anybody get a point? Okay, a couple of people got a point. If you figured out the relationship between theta and X, give yourself another point. Given these two things, try to finish the problem in the next two minutes. Sorry, yeah. How do I show everything there? Now I think you can see everything. How fast is the point Q moving along the x-axis when it's 20 meters from the center of the circle? So what's the angle? The hypotenuse is 20. Of the origin to P to Q, the hypotenuse is zero to Q. Origin to Q is 20. Zero to P is one of the sides is 10. That's a two to one ratio in the angle. We know that angle. Uh, 45 would be if the two sides were equal. But if one of the sides is half of the hypotenuse, 30, 60, 90. Okay, we actually don't need to know what the angle is because... Uh, the derivative of secant will be in terms of, well, what's the derivative of secant? Okay, let's, should we just do it together? We're running out of time. Let's do it together. What's the derivative of secant? So we're gonna differentiate both sides with respect to time. Derivative of secant is secant tan. So I get secant theta times tan theta times d theta dt, d theta dt. Give yourself a point if you differentiated secant correctly. And then I have this one over 10 meters, 10 meters times derivative of x with respect to t, which is what we're actually interested in. Okay, so when this distance is 20, what is the secant of theta? It's a hypotenuse over adjacent. Somebody said two. Secant is two. What is the tangent? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. What is the opposite? We have a one, two, root three. Yeah, so it's root three, 10 root three, 10 root three meters. And so the tangent was gonna be root three over one. Yeah, root three. Times d theta dt, and d theta dt is this uh, pi over six meters per second. Pi over six meters per second. Um, 
and something I don't like, because I'm about to multiply by 10 meters on both sides, then I'll get meters squared per second, but that's not how X is changing. What's wrong here? The secant, secant is always, secant is a length divided by a length. So it has no dimension. So this has no dimension, tangent has no dimension. The d theta dt we, we measured uh, in terms of um, these radians, which we converted to meters. So this is changing in meters per second. Um, dx dt should not be meters squared per second. Something's wrong here. So if I take dx dt, I'll get two root three, uh, I'll get 10 times two times root three times pi over six, pi over six. And now I'm getting meters squared per second. Of course it should be meters per second. Anybody see what's wrong? Well, it's asking for dx dt. And by the way, this should be negative because X is getting smaller and smaller. So where's the minus sign? The minus sign is that this is the speed at which we're moving, but actually theta is going from pi over two to zero. So this distance, this speed, the velocity is a negative. We're losing pi over two radians every 30 seconds. So that's at least solved one of the mysteries. This is a minus sign. D d theta is a minus sign. So X is changing at a negative amount. Why am I getting meters squared over, over seconds is a question we will, Fatima, you see it? Um, the pi over six is meters per second. Pi over six meters per second times 30 seconds. Secant should be unitless and X should be measured in meters. That's right, it should be dimensionless. Meters over meters and secant should be dimensionless also. Hang on, one at a time, Holland. on. Yes. Yes. Ah, this should be unit. This should be unitless. It's it's just over seconds. Yes. Yes. Well, well, x should be should be in meters. So dx dt should be meters per second, which means this should be one over seconds. Um. I agree. All right, we're, we've run out of time, which may be the thing that will save me here, and we'll fix this next time. But uh, this should be meters per second. The, the units on this side should be per second, nothing per second. Because if I, this is nothing, this has no dimension. So its units is one over second, not meters per second. So the unit on this side should be per second, DDT should be per second. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's this thing where we're measuring it in, it's the conversion from radians to, to meters. That's, that's the problem. DD theta, uh, uh, I'm, I'm confusing theta the angle and theta the position of P. We're gonna do this again on Friday and we'll get it right.